And we are now recording. So welcome, everybody. This is just sort of an informal and somewhat impromptu um, discussion about paper strategies for the Master of Wine uh, examination. And this is this also, uh, it, it's an essential part of the way that I, I teach, my, teach my wine business courses. Um, uh, and, and that is from a perspective of critical thinking. Uh, a little bit of background on this. In 1989, uh, there was a handful of Americans, six of us, uh, who went, were in London to sit the examination. None of us passed. And I was uh, uh, particularly uh, an epic fail. Um, and uh, there was no structure also, this was 1990, so there was no structure for study courses. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, the, uh, we, we kind of invented the modern course in, in the U.S. Uh, with, with the growing uh, numbers of MWs in, in the early 90s and in, into, uh, into the turn of the century. <laughs> um, what happened for me is I signed up for a writing course uh, that literally changed my life. Um, I uh, uh, had, had been researching some different types of writing courses and, and found one that, that seemed to suit my needs that would help me frame arguments and, and un understand different points of view. And um, I accidentally signed up for the wrong one. I showed up for it and participated for three days with 80 electrical engineers. Uh, it was um, a course on critical thinking and disruptive innovation. And uh, I'm 100% I'm truthful when I say if I hadn't stumbled onto this course with 80 other, with 80 electrical engineers and stayed for it, I, I don't believe I ever would have passed the examination. It was, it was that, that powerful and, and that important for me. And I think, Tim, you, you, you found the book on that, right? I did. I might even have it handy. Let's see. Oh, that's, that's fantastic. Here it is. Uh, I, and I, I highly recommend this. Yeah, it's um, a Clear Technical Writing. And who's the author on it? Author is John Brogan. John Brogan. So, so the, the, the course that I took was Brogan's uh, uh, Clear Technical Writing. Uh, I mistakenly signed up for the one uh, that was at the Stanford Court Hotel, which I was kind of projecting where I wanted to be, not which course I should be in. And, and the fundamental gist of the course was that they were looking at how over time, people in certain fields and with certain areas of expertise start to develop a, what's called a focal vocabulary. It's a vocabulary that, that only the people that are so sort of in, in the know, oh, and this is great, Sabrina uh, uh, put up a link to it. Yay, you guys are awesome. Um, but, but as you develop this, this technical knowledge, you, you, you start to speak in tongues to other people. Uh, you're using sometimes highly technical words, but sometimes also very casual words. And, and, and then when you try to pass that information downstream in the supply chain, uh, it makes it really hard for people to understand what you're talking about and and the focus of, the, of this program, especially for the electrical engineering community, writing the instructions, uh, being able to communicate with marketing in a way that they could easily communicate product attributes and instructions and so forth uh, with consumers. This was 1990. Uh, there was a technology called a VCR, okay? And you may, you may find one in a garage sale or see one on eBay or something. But there was a function on it that was, was highly studied and notoriously uh, uh, difficult for the user to actually use. 
and it was the clock. Um, it, would, it was a series of steps that you had to take and press this and hold this while doing this and, and whatever. And they had all this data on, on, on how many people were so intimidated when they just saw the instructions that they never even tried to set the time. Uh, the people who did go ahead and follow the instructions, uh, if there was a power outage or if they had to unplug it and move it to another room, they never set the clock again. And so it, on, on all the walls was a picture of the clock on a VCR and the little blue light on. And, and they said, you know, in millions of, of households around the world is this flashing reminder, you're too stupid to use me. So in this course, I started uh, uh, thinking about wine, thinking about this, this need that we all seem to have. Oh, we've got to educate the consumer. Well, in this course, this idea that you have to educate the consumer was actually uh, one of the worst uh, positions to be in, uh, rather than providing something intuitive and easy to use. But the point of it was really this, this, this development of expert opinions and uh, uh, vocabulary and, and terms, and a growing divide uh, between um, the experts and their own marketing department, and even more so to the consumer. Okay, so that's, that's the background to this. And uh, what I wanted to do is go through a couple of exercises that I've already done with a couple of you. So if I've done this exercise with you, uh, I'm gonna go through it again. Uh, don't give it away, but I, I wanted to, um, let me go ahead and share my screen. And I've, I've, I've marked down a couple of, of topics for us uh, uh, to look at today. And these are all, all three of these are actual examination questions. I, I, I believe, all, I know the first two are, I'm not sure of the last one. And it is. It is. It is. Okay, fantastic. Uh, this one, uh, for those who don't know, as, and, and larger, largely as a result of critical thinking and, learn, and, and learning how to completely reevaluate and, and, and potentially even disrupt paradigms, uh, you may or may not know that I'm actually uh, on a mission to end wine and food pairing. Uh, <laughs> and there's, there's a lot of information behind that, uh, but it's these kind of exercises and, and, and so forth that, that led me to a position uh, and, and uh, you know, uh, a lot of different sensory sciences and history and tradition. Because I'm so old, I also uh, am a chef and have a background uh, in the culinary arts with a, a very deep knowledge of French culinary history and traditions and, and culture uh, uh, back through the ages. And so wine and food matching is kind of a, a sham to begin with, but that's another story and that would be another webinar. Um, I'm doing that one Wednesday, or I'm sorry, Monday with my class. <laughs> All right. So for those of you who haven't done this before, um, one of the things in, inherent in, in writing a good essay is to really stick to the topic. Uh, if you're in the MW program, you've heard of lateral thinking. So you need, need to be able to develop a scope and a breadth or a depth and a breadth to every question. And this first question is one that uh, is a great illustration of how narrow our thinking uh, becomes. Now, who hasn't done this yet? Um, um, Michelle, have you done this exercise? No. no. Okay, great. Uh, and you can do this by, um, uh, by chat or, or live, everybody, uh, I'm glad to have everybody un unmute your mic. But there's a one word usually, it might be a couple of words, but, but almost without exception, there's a really key word in every question or topic that you're asked to write about. 
And so what is the key word in this question that really begs uh, definition? Match. Got it. All right. So match. When is wine a match for food? Uh, and there is no right or wrong. I've done this with hundreds and hundreds of people. Uh, and and there's, there's, there's kind of a, a likely outcome. But how would, how could we possibly define the word match? It's, it's too culturally based. Uh, it's too personally based. Uh, I teach this a lot. I'm an educator and I teach young people who don't know anything about this. And I say, I can't be, I can't get in your mouth and taste how you taste. So you have a personal preference for something and whether you like it or not, it's right. If, if I like something, it doesn't mean it's right. If you like something, it doesn't mean it's wrong. Great. So how are we defining the word match? Because here's, and, and that's perfect. Thanks, Michelle. And, and the, what happens when you don't practice finding that keyword and coming up with, with a clear definition or even better set of definitions, you start writing the wrong paper. So in this, in this particular instance, would, would, would you define this as a match of uh, food and wine based on traditional theory, traditional pairings, tr or would you be broader like I said, it really depends on your culture and your, and your background? So here's, here's, here's the craziness of this. How do you define the word match? Because an outstanding paper on this topic is so easy that you can't even see it, but we can't see it because of our focal vocabulary and our expertise. <laughs> Anybody else, Gus? Who else is out there? Come on, you guys. How do you find, Sabrina, how do you find, define the word match? No? Okay, this is, this is open. We did this in the, in, in the class, so I don't want to uh, just repeat. Well, let's go, uh, we'll go ahead and do it. Okay, so. Okay. Yeah, so here's, here's how we can define the word match. Oops, wrong tab. By the way, um, uh, uh, if you, uh, Michelle, if you ever wanna talk about subjectivity and, and taste and teaching it with kids, uh, set up a call with me. Okay, uh, I'd love to. <laughs> my, uh, uh, you know, I, I researched the, the, uh, the genetics and neurology of perception and how biological individualism and psychology uh, have us have such incredibly different perspectives on what we like and what we don't like and how we perceive things. And my research colleague is a um, uh, uh, ju just retired, but she's a board certified pediatrician and sensory scientist just retired from Cornell. Um, well, it would be fascinating because I teach I, one of the classes that I teach has um, multiple different cultures, students from multiple different cultures. Yep. Who all come from different culinary uh, backgrounds or food backgrounds and uh, may or may not like wine. Yep. So well, this, this, is, this, is, this, this totally transcends wine. And it's got some fun exercises you can do with the kids, too, that mm -hmm. obviously don't involve wine. Right. Uh, one, of, one of the markers we use for uh, for a certain trigeminal sensitivity, uh, I use Scotch as a marker for for my audience. She uses um, uh, Altoid mints because the schools get a little pissed off when you bring Scotch into the classroom. Okay. <laughs> 
All right. So here's, that, here's, here's what I want you to do, Michelle. I want you to think if you were walking down the street and, and you went up to somebody with no context and asked them, what does the word match mean? What would they say? Uh, that they're, they're, they're equivalent. They're equal. They're on par. Right. They actually might even say that it's a piece of wood, cardboard, or other flammable material tipped with a chemical substance that produces a fire when rubbed rough or chemically... Noun, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and then we've got all of these nouns, something that equals or resembles, something able to cope with another as an equal, meeting somebody's match, uh, an exact counterpart, so like an exact opposite, uh, correspondingly suitable associated. This is how most, most wine people immediately jump to the definition. Mm -hmm. It's also a game or a contest, right? And so forth. And then uh, considered with regard to suitability as a partner in marriage. Okay? Which could have been wine pairing. Pardon? Which could equate to food and wine pairing. Every one of these could. <laughs> and they're not asking you about wine and food pairing. They're, they're asking about a match. When is wine a match for food? Wine can be a match, considered a match for food, dependent entirely on how one defines or interprets the word match. For example, wine can be a match for food when it provides the spark at the table, when it illuminates, when it brings people out in convivial and whatever. That's when wine can be a match for food. Would you agree or disagree? Yes. So actually, this could work. Wine could be a match for food because actually many people say wine is food. And then you can write a little bit more. So actually you can take, there's, there's we, we, we've identified fundamentally seven primary definitions for the word match. Your opening, your introduction just says it, that you're going to illustrate how when wine is a match for food is dependent upon definition or interpretation of the word. You then outline all seven of those and write a paragraph on each. And, and you've actually written a successful paper. Does any of, do any of these jump out as, as to something that you could not pull into when wine is a match for food, when it's a competition in your mouth, when the flavors are fighting like a boxing match, or when there's competition, wine can be a match for food in the eye of the consumer when dining out, when making purchases in a store, uh, balancing out how much is gonna be spent and competing for, and even at the table, competing for the attention. All you have to do to show wine and food can be a competitive match is put a, a chef and a winemaker on a panel and ask them which is more important, the wine or the food. <laughs> I've had those conversations. Yep. So, so the point of, of this exercise is to show how we kind of, whatever our background, and I love, I love where you're coming from, Michelle. You didn't actually go to the wine and food cliche, oh, it's the harmony, the balance, you know, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, you actually did it from, because you teach about these things. And uh, so that was very cool. So do you see how you could write a, an excellent paper on this with an, a nice introduction, a number of definitions, a segment, written about each of those and then a conclusion obviously wine is a match for food in many ways and blah 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 yeah that's great and this this can can you put it on the uh 
on the uh, year one assessment, please? <laughs> <laughs> well, back when they used to invite me to lecture, uh, they kicked me out, actually, when I was uh, espousing umami. <laughs> well, umami is big now. Everybody talks about umami. I know. I don't know if you know it, but I actually introduced the word into our language. Hmm. So, and, and, and that, was, that was all part of what was going on for me in 1990 when I started to ask scientists outside of wine or about sensations and perception and neurology and all that kind of stuff. And all the scientists were talking about umami and everybody else was, oh, what, we've already got four tastes, isn't that enough? And now, and now there's, there's actually a basis for, for hundreds of tastes, if not thousands, but that's another story. Okay. All right, so let's move on to the next one. And um, so, so this is the next, how, and this was actually the compulsory question uh, paper in paper one. Uh, my first, um, well, in 1990 when I sat and actually passed the exam. Um, so what, what is, what's the word here? that really, really begs for um, uh, a definition or a context or, or explanation. The best. Yep. You've got this, girl. Yes. So, so now we're talking best out of a site. And one of the things, critical thinking, all right, just, just to go in, into a real quick explanation, critical thinking is looking for a point of dissonance or differentiation or argument in points of view about a topic. And then rather jumping to your normal conclusion or trying to figure it out, you look at, at the points of view or the opinions where there is the argument or the dis, dis, dissonance. And then you say, okay, this person's point of view is based on what data? All right. What's the basis for that opinion? And, and then you look at the other point of view, what's their basis, what's their data that their opinion is based on. You then try to carefully evaluate the data and determine what's speculation, what's valid, what's, what's true as best is known. And then you take all of the valid data and then see if you can create a new way of rethinking the, the issue or the topic or, or the problem. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So applying critical thinking in a question like this and in so many of the questions, when you look at, at the word best, can you create kind of a cliche? What's the best you're trying to extract out of a site? Uh, uh, in, in the most basic terms in the fine wine business. You want to produce, you want to have it say that producing the, uh, the, the, best, the ripeness that you're looking for, the expression of the grape that you're looking, or the varietal that you're looking for, the yield that you're looking for, yeah, and bingo, and, and this is one of the ones that, that we're going to go back to, but it's blah, blah, blah. We know what that is, right? So, so it really boils down to the best in terms of suitability for making a, a specific type or style of wine that, that, that is uh, accepted in the market and, and, in, and demanded by the market. Would that sound pretty good? Mm -hmm. Okay. What's, 
Can you think of something totally opposite of that that could be the best a manager could do? For a high yielding generic uh, bulk line. And what's the key thing? What's the best they're looking for? We know what the best is in terms of, 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 you know, uh, uh, comp. Yeah. 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 The high yield will, while still high yield while still expressing varietal. How about dropping that? There's something else that that's even more important at the total opposite, because here I'm going to say. At this extreme, I'm going to say regardless of cost. Ah, uh, yes. So high yield. You could low just cost. Have maximum maximum overall sugar uh, creation for say the production of brandy and distil distillation. Mm -hmm. Yep. But yeah. what's but yeah, what's the good. best that they're they're aiming for? The, the highest financial return. Yes. Money, money, money. So oh, there you go. Gus is, yep. And so that is dollars. Uh, if you're in La Marcha, the, the most potential for that vineyard is not going to be case one. It's going to be, um, how can I, you know, I might be making distillation. It might be the best for that vineyard. Yes. Now, would, would you say that pretty well sums up two extreme examples? Hey, Tim. Yeah. The only thing I might add to your second one is for a limited cost investment, meaning it's not at any cost. It would be a limited scope of investment so we don't um, overdo how much we want to make on this, if you know what I mean. Absolutely, because it's all about... Uh, return, how, how, how much can you suck out of it? The, the important thing to know, you're going to do that with the cost of the wine here. Here, it's just a commodity. You've got a, a fruit. You're, it may be destined uh, back, back in when, when I took the exam in 1990. The, the French government was trying to limit uh, vineyard plantations, but they, they provided a special relief for high yield low quality vineyards uh, uh, by, by setting a, a price for, for grapes uh, that were solely intended to go to gasohol, right? To be mixed with gasoline to go in the cars. And it was more profitable and it was profitable. So actually pe people started planting more vineyards. So I'm actually, what I'm gonna do now, is gonna, I'm, I'm gonna number these rather than do this because what you, what you want to be able to develop, and I, I, I can pretty much guarantee you most everybody in the study course and who take the exam don't spend enough time looking at the question. They start writing before they have formulated their strategy. And then as a result, they end up in a black hole and they don't even talk about uh, the particular question at hand. And you, you hear about this all the time. Well, you didn't, your answer didn't pertain to the actual question. And that's how you get off track is, is by not having this as a practice and a rigor uh, for doing it. So is there somewhere towards the rightness, the expression, but not regardless of the cost, that, that we, could, we could take as an, inter, we're, we're gonna try and create two or three intermediary points. <clears throat> so it'd be basically all the above, but <laughs> cost is limited, okay? All right, not regardless of cost. Then you could have a, a point middle between two extremes. Another point, and this, this could be two points, it could be five points. It, 
uh, but but usually you want to, you, you know, you're you're under time restraints, so you've got to manage your time. So um, and then you might want one that's sort of uh, uh, leaning towards uh, lower operating costs. Higher yields. Okay, does that make sense? So, in terms of brands, where would you, so the the number five would be kind of your unless uh, in Canadian dollars because I'm in Canada, your seven or eight dollar because we don't we're not allowed to have three dollar wine. It's illegal. Uh, <laughs> um, so your $8 Pinot Grigio, your Citra, your basic Pinot Grigio at the bottom. Hang on just one second, because that's going to be a very important step. But what you need to do is begin actually framing out exactly what's being asked in the question and don't don't divert okay, from so it until right. you're done. Okay, yeah, so I'm losing it here. Okay. No, I'm no, it's perfect. You're being sucked into the black hole. I just got sucked in. Yes, I did. Yeah, yeah. And, and you'll never stop doing that, but you can really practice learning to do exactly what you did. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on. Let me go back to the question. I'm not done yet. Um. Uh, Michelle, do you use mind mapping at all? How do you outline? I, how do I outline? When I'm researching something, I do what I call a brain dump, which is everything that I know. Okay, and, great. And then I do, then I, then I circle, then I go, <laughs> I use lots of different colors. I, because I, I write everything. I okay, circle. now hang on. So, so I'm asking this when you're when you're writing a practice paper. Oh, when I'm writing a practice paper, yeah, no, I, I get my main points down. I, I don't do a mind map. I have I'm more linear than that, so I have my main points. I throw down my main points in my Great. head. Then I order them, and then I put sub points. Great, sort of like this, right? Kind of like what you're doing here, exactly. I, but but the mind map thing where you have the circle and the lines that are going all over the place, I don't do that. Okay, great. Because I do, and everybody needs to find the best system for you. So so that that would be a sign of a more linear thinking, and and absolutely uh, uh, great for people who minds work that way. And then mind mapping is for ADHD, dyslexic. Uh, people like me and I'm serious about that because my brain's just firing and I can't manage and I and I actually learned mind mapping in 1990 in that conference or that that I went went to by mistake and I introduced that also to the to the institute yeah mind mapping I've, I've tried mind mapping it doesn't really suit the way no, I think. it's for it's for some people and not for others all right, so I'm going to just sort of do this a, a little bit more quickly here. And this is how you write your paper. And, you, and what you can learn from this is this, whether you're using mind mapping, whether you're using standard structured um, outlining, this is, this is how a paper can look. And you can organize it. You 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 can manage it. You 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 actually write your introduction and your um, uh, uh, conclusion last. All right. So then, what we would want to do here is an introduction. Here's a conclusion. Now remember, you're supposed to show mastery over. Oops, God. Over typing. Well, and I'm dyslexic, <laughs> so so I've, I've got the trifecta. And, and <laughs> <it's related. laughs> oh, sorry. 
So I write a, I write a three, I, I word, I write a, an email that says, thank you very much and spend five minutes going back and correcting it. Okay. So here's how, here's a strategy for taking a paper like this and, and so many where there's a simple word in here that you really need to call out and really focus on. So a, a vineyard manager must understand the destination of his goods, the market for his grapes, and then extracting the best is completely subject to the market, the expectations of, 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 the, of the consumer, the critics, and, and, and the trade, and then how the, 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 the fruit will be processed and the value added through the supply chain and the value chain. For example, many people immediately jump to the best being Petrus and Opus and Romane Conti and Grange and so on and so forth. Typically, you'll find very tight vine spacing. Now write about vine spacing from there. And if you can provide specific examples, awesome. And most of us can. Trellising and canopy manage or trellising is very important because you're really working to limit the, the, the nutritional uh, accessibility of the vine. You're looking at uh, 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 establishing a, a vine structure uh, that's consistent and sometimes even required by law for certain regions of the world, provide examples in Burgundy and this and that. So the trellising must provide the structure and so forth and whatever. And then the canopy management is going to be specific to the proper amount of exposure and don't Forget to throw in things like sauterne and ecam and whatever when the best might be rotten grapes. Because that's the other thing. Because we tend to jump to something very quickly, we've, we, oh, we comple completely forget about all the other iterations uh, uh, that, that would show mastery over the subjects. That makes sense? Mm -hmm. So next. Okay, that's La La Land, and that's, that's a world that's a tiny, tiny fraction of the world production. The market has high demands. You're, you're working to the scores and to the critics and, and to the futures markets and this and that. Extracting the best out of the site could also mean that, yes, you're working towards very specific composition of the, the pH, the sugar, the alcohol potential, the phenolics, the you know, ripeness of the phenolics and development, et cetera, et cetera. But you do have certain limitations of cost because you're selling into a certain market segment of fine wines, but you, you cannot have the costs associated with the ultra, you know, uh, luxury category. And then you talk about vine spacing and trellising and canopy management from and give examples. Now hit the middle of the road, just to determine kind of what price range that is and talk about, you know, these wonderful Cabernets, Cote de Rhone, Chateau de Pops, Australian, whatever, New Zealand, this, this and that where they're really working to balance uh, the cost and the, uh, and the qualities of the grapes and the requirements of the market, and then talk about some examples of each of them there. Now we finally got to your Pinot Grigio. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, and, you, know you, you can give examples from your market in, in all of these, but don't forget to, is every time you get a chance, say, you know, here's what's, Here's how this relates to wines in Chile, and here's examples from this. What, it, what you're going to find is you're not, you're not writing all this trivia and, and all this wayward stuff. You're really, really on task. And then when you get to the, the sixth line, 
hey, line spacing, you got to get machinery in there. You've got to you've got to be able to to you know to plant to machine prune if you prune at all you're trying to pump out as many tons per acre you know you've got um uh, you know this is this is how you do it and give examples of that including grapes that might be sometimes uh sold into the wine market, but oftentimes you just simply sell it off because you're achieving certain levels and it's going off for brandy or something like that or gasohol in, in other years. And then boom, there's your conclude write a conclusion and you've got a paper that really, really demonstrates a starting point, you know, two endpoints, intermediary points. Uh, you're you're talking about each each of the, the areas they're looking for, the vine spacing, the trellising, the can, canopy control. And uh, you've offered specific examples and the examiner will go, well, that covers it. Thank you very much. Any questions on that? Comments? It's just good to be able to think about focusing on the question. Yeah, and 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 uh, it it is just so amazing how people want to argue about papers and what you, this and that, and and you can also begin when you're when you're work, doing other you know study groups and and going to the the study course and so on. You'll see how many people start writing and or jabbing, jabbering about a a topic with, with and literally. They're totally off track. They're they're totally off off the question. Okay, so in this one, it's best. Okay, in this one, it was match. And this is most important in those questions where you just sit there and just totally struggle. All right. So let's take this last one. We'll we'll give this a a, a good go and, and wrap things up. Um, what word or words in here are are jumping out? Rural. Okay. Justified. Okay. And changing. So. No. <laughs> up, 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 rolls. It's actually what's what the heck's an intermediary? Now you're going to need to talk about roles, but the one that really is important in this is understanding and creating a list of intermediaries. Explaining what their role is between a producer and a consumer, and then discussing if it can be justified, and then how it's changing using several markets. So let me take you through this one, because this one's, let's see, who's on, let's see, I'm, I'm losing, I'm getting this stuff. Oh, okay, Mich Michael had to go. Sorry, Michael, no problem. Um, all right. So, so let's let, let me let me just sort of flesh this one out for you. And if if we were just to make a list of intermediaries, oops, what am I doing? What's, what is an intermediary? First of all, this one actually begs a def definition. A role is, is a, a, a part you play, all right? So, so that one's pretty, pretty obvious. Producers should be obvious. Consumer justification is speculative, but, but that's, that's gonna be in each of uh, the roles that we're creating. So, so if we were to create a list of intermediaries, 
and and trying to think through the through um, in my wine business course we've got the the supply chain value chain so between the producer and the consumer who are the intermediaries distributors distributors absolutely who else sommeliers now when you say something like distributor that's very early in the supply chain right I've gone right to the end yeah from the beginning yes. to the end. no and and so and and so just make a note of it and say oh distributors who else at, at the very early stage of all this is is an intermediary okay and distributors is right on let me see i've got someone on chat Okay, so Gus is saying brokers, absolutely. Now there's one that's that's very close to a distributor, but it's it's sort of in a more international trade context. Importer? Yep. Okay, then 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 what what might be next i think the problem is that it really depends on your market well right all we're doing is brainstorming here we're not bounding it so In so Canada, we've got agents and the and the the monopoly <laughs> that's all we've got no this this that's that is terrific now is a monopoly a distributor and an importer yes okay so monopolies who who are so but we're gonna that's perfect because we're gonna make that distinction Okay, great. Who else are the intermediaries? Where'd you gonna find this could be a really long list? Yeah, how about, how about tasting rooms? Yeah. I mean, closer down the bottom, but yeah. Well, so so I'm gonna sort of put them in, in an order that we go. So we're gonna, I'm gonna say rest, let's go to point of sale restaurant retail no i'm sorry wait what did you just say on, I said, on that i said tasting room which is sort of a yeah. retail as you know as well as direct to consumer kind of location yeah what about things like blogs and wine searcher okay now are they in the intermediary between the producer and the consumer how are we defining what is an so what hang on a second introduction define intermediary and that's this is that's perfect what you just said because i, I want to show you something on that intermediary all right for the purpose of this paper I am going to address commercial I'm actually going to define intermediary as anyone or any company, or we're going to do this as anyone, <laughs> as anyone 
who has a financial or logistics role in the commercial area of the wine supply chain. It can be argued that media bloggers, etc., can be viewed as intermediaries and then explain why why you are or are not using them and i would i would actually say why why you are not including them so what this does is is it gives the 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 examiner okay they see this but they're not going in that direction for this paper does that make sense Or you may choose to go there, but I, I would advise against it because as you're going to see, you're going to run out of time really quick on this one. Okay, does that make sense? All right, great. So, so this is actually going to be a part of your um, your introduction is defining intermediary, and then you may want to talk about justification and and change. All right, just because basically in the introduction you're just rewriting the the question. All right giving giving uh, context giving definitions and 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 establishing the scope of your paper and that's why you can also include that you know you're not going to talk about intermediaries as as the people like informational intermediaries you're going to talk about the commercial and and a lot of that could depend on which paper but this is in the business of wine part of it right anybody know what paper this was it's paper four Paper four. Yeah. All right. So that's going to be our our intro. Uh, what are we missing in our our um, intermediaries list? We got it down pretty well. Well, so Gus wrote to, in the in the in the chat uh, shippers and freight forwarders. Yeah, that. Yep. And so, and then where would the, those would go? Even but so you've got shipping and lo logistics, right? Anybody heard of um, courtiers? Yeah. And where does a courtier fit? What is a courtier and where does it fit? Distributors. What's that? Before distributors. Yes. And so so we could actually even take that out of there. And maybe even just do one on sort of because it's sort of now the broker is is somebody who's operating as a paid representative of a company, and a courtier is actually somebody who enjoys a certain uh, position of accessibility and availability that may or may not actually be paid by the winery, but but they are definitely an intermediary, and actually. When, when I think of it that way, that means then that I want to make those distinctions. 
Okay. Well, and we're also missing retail stores, right? Oh, of course, yes. And what else are we missing? Internet online? Yep. And online, you can even further break down into um, but wouldn't DTC be online? Or is not DTC is, is, is separate from that? Tasting room DTC is, is, is could be seller door. It, it's actually transactional at, on a face-to-face -face basis. And so it would probably be very good to, to group these close to each other. And online could be D to C kind of, of considerations, <clears throat> but there's also third party uh, resellers. Yes. Yeah. All right. That are not D to C, and um, and then there's then there's just online wine sales, which. Uh, uh, winery website which is not even a rounding area error okay now one of the things to remember there's wine clubs that are d to c and there's wine clubs third party right so Virgin Wine Club, uh, Wall Street Journal Wine Club, KCBS Radio Wine Club. Uh, isn't, that, isn't that the same thing as third party resellers though? Uh, no, well, yeah, yes and no. Wine.com, and, and, and this is where now you start to go in like, like whom, providing examples, right? So these third-party resellers may or may not take actual ownership, but, but and they may have a wine club, but the transaction doesn't require a membership. Right, okay. And, and again, not only in writing your papers, but learn to start to deconstruct when, when you're speculating, reading articles, go, oh, wait, how can I break this down? How can I organize this? systematically from beginning to end and then you can say oh you know what sommeliers actually they're you know they're the salesmen the restaurant in the restaurant but even more importantly than the sommelier is 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 the buyer because if, if you can't get the, and, and so in, in my business class, we talk about these as the gatekeepers, All right? So in retail, you've got, you know, on floor sales and you've got buyer, okay. So, so now you can start to go in and, and it might be under monopolies, um, uh, You can say things like you can use Quebec, right? Or is Quebec? We're all a monopoly. Quebec, Ontario. The only, the only province that's not a monopoly is Alberta. Well, don't they have privatized stores in BC now? Some, not all. Oh, so this would be great because because what you want this is <coughs> this is exact. So <laughs> wait a minute. Hang on. <laughs> It, are they justified and how are they changing and use different examples, right? So now what you do is you speculate justified, changing and examples. And guess what? Copy and paste. Oops. All 
right? And so for each one of these then, the beauty of all this is you're gonna find you're not writing these volumes about isolated things, you're hitting things topically. You're showing that you understand, I know what an intermediary is, I can provide examples of who they are. I can, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the, the shipping and logistics. I'm just gonna say shipping and logistics is gonna be required whether you're, 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 you're small selling only to, to local restaurants, whether, whether you've just gotta move the wine from the winery over to the tasting room, whether, you know, regardless of how you're, you're doing, uh, shipping and logistics will be justified. It's changing because of, of the incredible change of shipping and logistics around the world, driven by Amazon.com and eBay and these kind of things. And there's competition and there's and the blah, blah, blah. And then you can give some examples, you know, here's, here's what's going on with, with, with these kind of logistics and shipping companies and the lowering of costs and, and, and uh, that kind of stuff. So Make sense? Mm -hmm. So you would, you would then basically go through the list. Uh, courtiers, are they justified? Only for a tiny speck of the business, and that's changing. Um, more and more the, 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 the buying and the traditions of Bordeaux, which is pretty much associated with courtiers, that's changing radically, et cetera, et cetera. So you go through and, and, and you add your, go back to your question, justified, changing, uh, show examples, and you go through and write, write, write a couple sentences uh, for each paragraph and you're done. Make sense? Yeah, matter of being able to do it under pressure in an hour. <laughs> right, and and so in this so 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 this gets to my final recommendation, and then then we can kind of wrap this up. Don't spend your time writing papers. Spend your time learning to 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 be with the question longer than than you tend to be to look at these key words that are really, really going to dictate what's, what, what's necessary in the paper. And then learning to, to, to get a, a really great structure for your outline, whether it's traditional or mind mapping, whatever works best for you. And you never start writing until you go, huh, I got this. Make sense? Yep. So the critical thinking is when it's being being asked for, they, they'll, they'll many times bring up things and your brain's just going, oh my God, there are so many opinions. There's, there's no answer to this. Other questions are gonna be strictly technical. You need to be able to say, this is this procedure or practice or additive or this or that. But what you'll start to do is really relish when they ask you a loaded question that is begging for you to find opposite opinions and midpoints. And those are the ones that most people have, have uh, the hardest time with. And you just sort of sit back, breathe, be with the question and, and, and make it also the practice as you're going through, do I have everything covered? Um, am I staying on task with vine spacing, tre trellising, and canopy control? And then say, yeah, okay, now I can write my paper, and you just follow this, and, and you're done, okay? Okay, so that is our lecture for today. Thank you very much, Tim. That was very helpful. You're, you're ab absolutely welcome, and, and stay in touch, and let me know how, how things are going, and, and let me know if there's any any things that come up uh, that you need uh, uh, help with uh, on the, uh, and I'll post this for anybody who cares on the, uh, on the MW um, uh, student website, okay? Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye now.